is of power because we are kings and our words matter. From the curses that has to do with our spirit, soul and body. Curses that has to do with our family, finances and the work of our hands. Curses that has to do with our social things, oppression and so on. All those curses. Christ has redeemed us from those curses, he says. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. Be still. This is God's word for you. Be still. No matter what you're going through. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that healeth thee. the God that healeth me. has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us as it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree now he's talking about the cross and giving a totally new exposition he says there on the cross of Calvary he literally became a curse redeemed us from the curse of the law what is the curse of the law Deuteronomy 28 we saw first 14 verses describes the blessings verse 15 onwards describes the cursings in many many verses if you see in the curse, in the curse section, in the chapter, you will see all kinds of things. You will see everything from physical illness to material 
uh, uh, poverty, social oppression, family problems, <clears throat> children becoming good for nothing, family disintegrating, being destroyed and ruined. It's talking about talking about finances being ruined. You work a lot and earn a little, work so much and have nothing. It's talking. You read the passage. It's very interesting. And it's talking about all kinds of difficulties and problems of spirit, soul, body, family, finances, work of hands. It is talking about difficulties in every area of human life. All this is described as the curse of the Lord. It's a very interesting section if you read of it. But remember when you read it, you always say, this is not for me because I am redeemed from the curse of the law. Remember to say that. Just be don't reading the curse and get scared. Because that can be a scary section. When you read that, always remember, you're redeemed from the curse of the law. When it says you will earn, I mean, you will work much but earn little, he says, that's not me. I'm blessed because I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. So when he says Christ became a curse for us on the cross and redeemed us from the curse of the law, he's talking about what is described in Deuteronomy chapter 28 as curses and says he redeemed us from those curses, from the curses that has to do with our spirit, soul and body, curses that has to do with our family, finances and the work of our hands, curses that has to do with our social things, oppression and so on. All those curses. Christ has redeemed us from those curses, he says. This is the meaning he gives to the cross of Calvary. So, right here you see, even though he said the gospel is just the death, burial and resurrection, then in Galatians he comes and begins to mention how we are redeemed from the curse of the law, which includes a whole variety of things because, of the, curse of, because the curse of the law has to do with a whole lot of things with spirit, soul and body and so on. Amen? So you understand what the gospel is. The gospel, just like Jesus said, is for the poor, is for the brokenhearted, is for the blind, is for the oppressed, is for the captives that are in chains and bondages. The gospel has to do with all kinds of human problems. It is addressing all kinds of human problems. Amen? But we've been looking at Isaiah chapter 1 verse, eight, verse 19. Where, what does it say? If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. Now, Willing and obedient, those two conditions. Now those two conditions are not stating, they are not, a, they are not saying that, that it is by works we get the blessing. No, bless, you're already blessed. Everybody say, I'm already blessed. <laughs> That's the problem. You're already blessed. But because God doesn't push it down your throat, God honors you, God respects you, you're a human being, you've got a will, you can walk in the blessings only if you're willing and you're obedient. Willingness means that you embrace this truth, that you believe in what God has done for you. And obedience means to listen, to listen to God's counsel, to listen to God's instructions, to listen to what God says. If you would just be willing to accept what he has done and believe these truths and listen to him as he guides you and leads you, then you will eat the best of the land. It doesn't say you'll eat the best in heaven. It'll eat, you'll eat the best of the land. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Gospel was preached to us as well as to them. To who? According to the context, it is talking about the people under Moses who came out of the bondage of Egypt. Gospel was preached to them as well as to us. It's another way of saying the same gospel that is preached to us was preached to them. Or the same gospel that was preached to them was preached to us. The gospel is only one. There is no Old Testament gospel and New Testament gospel. It's only, only one. Old, te Old Testament is the foretelling of all that the gospel involves and the New Testament is the fulfillment of all that was foretold in the Old Testament. But the gospel is the one and the same. The gospel was preached to Abraham, Galatians 3 says. And now here we are told the gospel was preached to Mo people of Moses' days. The gospel was preached to them as well as to us. Can you believe that? The same gospel that is preached to us was preached to them. And it says, but the word which they heard, it did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. 
In other words, whatever they heard did not profit. They didn't enjoy the blessings that the gospel promised because they did not mix what they heard with faith. It's talking about how the whole generation that came out of Egypt, out of bondage, even though land of milk and honey was promised to them. I showed you what the gospel was preached, what gospel was preached to them. I took you to Exodus chapter 3, where God told, came and told them, I saw your cry, I saw your oppression, I saw what was happening to you, I saw how they are treating you, I've come down from heaven to deliver you. Is that the end of the gospel? To deliver them and leave them there? No. And to take you to a good, Land that flows with milk and honey. <laughs> Don't forget that. That's in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 onwards. I've come down to deliver you, but just the deliverance is not the gospel, but to take them to a good land that flows with milk and money, honey. Not just land where you can get milk and honey, but flows with milk and honey. Everybody say flows with milk and honey. That means abundant prosperity. That means unlimited prosperity. All right. Now, so the gospel is not just deliverance. It's also going into the land of milk and honey. It's not over until you go to the land of milk and honey. Unfortunately, these people never went. One whole generation died in the wilderness. That's why it says they did not profit them. They heard the word. The gospel was preached to them. The same thing we hear was preached to them. But they did not benefit because they did not believe it. It's not because God couldn't take them. It's not because God failed them. It's not because God didn't fulfill his promises. It's because they failed to believe and walk in willingness and obedience. They did not hear what God said. They were unwilling to obey God. That's why a whole generation perished except Joshua and Caleb. This is a history. This is reality. Now read Job 36 verse 11. Same conditions are laid out here. It says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Hello. Some of you are not able to believe that this is in the Bible. If they obey and serve him, <laughs> same thing. Whatever Isaiah 119 says, this says. If you're willing and obedient, stated in different ways. If they will simply listen to God and serve him, what easy conditions. You, know, you, need, you don't need to, you know, do something great. You don't have to climb up a mountain and go 500 miles on your knees or something like that. No. If you simply obey and serve him, what will happen? They shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. When I was growing up, I told you I was baptized into Christianity. I was born and raised in Christian surroundings, and I've heard Christian preaching, and I'm telling you not to just, you know, be complaining about the old days, but I'm just saying that this is the truth. Unfortunately, they told me that if you obey and serve him, you better get ready because you're going to suffer. Now, this is no exaggeration. Those who have heard it, you know this is what has been told. If you obey and serve God, you're going to suffer. So, and, uh, you know, preachers were also saying, you know, that you're going to take baptism. That's, what, that's when your trouble starts. After you get baptism, boy, oh, you're going to have a lot of trouble come your way. You're going to suffer, suffer, suffer. And, oh, my, you're going to suffer. You're going to be a life of suffering. And baptism is only a certificate, a degree to suffer. <laughs> so once you're baptized, you're ready to suffer now. So Christian life is a suffering life, they, tell, they said. And I said, where does it say it in the Bible? They said, Job. <laughs> Job suffered. So there was a lot of people coming our way in our church in all those days and testifying. I'm another Job, they said. <laughs> and they told wonderful testimonies about how they suffered. And, and we all sat there and said, my God, you know, thank God these things didn't happen to me. You know, when will these things happen to me? That's next, I think, you know. This is what we thought, you know. Suffering. Job suffered, they said. So you must suffer also. Job is an upright man. He's a man of God. That's why he suffered. And everybody that is, you know, like this, a man of God will suffer. And then they said, well, brother, show me something in the New Testament. They said, Paul suffered. Look at him. His thorn in the flesh and his, all his troubles and problems and everything. 
You see, Job's suffering, if you read the Bible in the first three chapters, everybody is an expert in the first three chapters. One of the famous verses in Christianity is, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. It's a famous verse for the preachers as well as for all the believers, I think. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Simply solves all their problems. Anything happens, they can stand there and say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. So when all the bad things happen, you can, you can imagine what the preacher is going to come and tell you. you know. He's got a whole Bible in his hand. <laughs> you know, he's going to pick that one verse. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. That's the one verse he's going to resort to somehow. To relieve him of all the tension there. And relieve everybody of tension. It's all in God's hands. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. That's what Job said. Now whatever Job said, just because it's in the Bible, that's not the truth. The fact that he said is true. It is recorded by the Holy Spirit in the Bible so that we may read and learn something from it. But the Bible also says, divide the word of truth rightly. Rightly dividing the word. So you must rightly divide the word. Why? Because you shouldn't take what Job said and take it as your golden verse and hang it before and say, the Lord give it to the Lord. Take it. Why does the Bible say you must rightly divide the word? That means you must take the word and look at who said it. Why did they say it? What was the what, Is what he said right? Was he making a statement of truth? Is that a statement of truth? Is that the truth? If you go to the end of Job, Job says, Lord, I've spoken things unknowingly. I have blabbered, he says, literally. I've just opened my mouth and let loose and I've blabbered and so I've done wrong. I will shut my mouth now. Forgive me, he says. You speak and I will listen. I've said things that are wrong, he says. See, nobody has read that. The last three chapters, nobody's expert of. I'm telling you the truth. Again, I'm not complaining. In the old days, they told us about the first three chapters only. But the Bible says in the New Testament, expressly it says, consider the end of Job. It didn't say consider the beginning of Job. Because they all know that you consider the beginning. Everybody's an expert in the beginning of Job. Chapter 1, 2, and 3, we are experts. That's why New Testament says, consider the end of Job. Read the last three chapters because that is where it says, Job says, I'm sorry, Lord, I opened my mouth and I blabbered. I said things that I should not have said. I'm a dumb idiot, he said. I'll shut my mouth. You please speak and I will listen now. I've said it wrong. I don't know nothing. I will shut my mouth. You will speak now. And then God turned his captivity. This I never heard preached in those days. God turned his captivity and gave him double of everything that he lost. Have you, have you ever heard that preached? <laughs> the man who said the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away repented of what he said and got right with God and asked God's forgiveness and the Lord turned his captivity and gave him double of whatever he had and he went on with his life blessed as ever and lived happily ever after and nobody told me about that. And they were hoping I wouldn't read about that and find out. And I read and found out about that. And I know why the Bible says, consider the end of Job. Particularly read the end of Job, it says. Read the end. The end of the story. That is because that is what God did. Then what happened at the beginning? Job himself says that also. He says, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. You see, faith and fear are opposite forces. Faith works positively, moves mountains. Does miracles, brings healing, brings prosperity, brings blessings. Faith moves obstacles. Faith makes you a winner. Faith is a positive force. What is fear? Fear is exactly the opposite of faith. It does exactly the opposite of faith. If you are afraid, you will make a mountain out of nothing. If you are afraid, you will become sick. You will become worn out. You will become tired mentally. You will become terrified. If you're afraid, you'll bring upon you all kinds of evils because fear is like a magnet that pulls all evil to you. You see, if you take a magnet, steel magnet, it will attract a safety pin, but not a toothpick. Why? There is a law in operation. Like things 
attract. Right? <laughs> like things attract. There is a law on operation. Toothpick is not a like thing. That's why it doesn't attract. It's a steel magnet. It doesn't attract a toothpick. But it attracts a safety pin because it is a like thing. So if you're afraid, boy, you're finished. Because you got a law, a spiritual law at work. See, that's why the Bible teaches so much about fear. 365 times somebody said it talks about do not fear. I've not counted it, but I believe it. Because I think all these things happen like this. Bible talks so much about fear. Fear, fear. Get rid of fear. Why? So many times you are told, told fear not. Because if you fear, you're finished. Because if you fear, you will attract like things. You will attract disasters your way. You will attract lack and want. You will attract poverty. You will attract every loss and every kind of thing that is bad your way. If you're afraid, then you must deal with that because there is a spiritual law in operation, my friend. If you have faith, then there is another spiritual law at work. That spiritual law means that something good is now going to happen to you because you believe according to your faith, it shall be to you. There is a spiritual law. Just like the physical laws at work, there is a spiritual law at work. Right? That's why Job had those things happen. What about Paul? They say, Paul suffered, brother. Saint of God, he was suffering. Well, he suffered. But what was he suffering for? He's suffering for the sake of the gospel of Christ. Because he went and preached the gospel, he got a lot of persecution. Mark chapter 10, I think verse 30 or 31, it says that anyone that leaves his mother, father, brother, sister, house, lands, whatever, he will get a hundred times more in this life and in the life to come with persecutions, right? Persecution is one thing the Bible definitely says. Jesus himself said, they hated me, they'll hate you, right? If they hated me, they'll hate you. You think the world that hated Jesus is going to love you? They'll, they're going to hate you for the same reason they hated him. So you get persecutions. But you get a lot of blessings, but along with it, a lot of persecutions. But what these people took is they made Paul a big, poor man. Paul was a poor preacher. He was not like Sam Chaladurai. And all these preachers that you see. But he was a poor preacher, they said. Oh, he was so poor. They make it look like he was going around with a plate in his hands, you know. House to house, eating some food somewhere and going from town to town preaching. No. He was a mighty preacher of the gospel who went from corner to corner in the world and filled the whole. They said the people that have turned the world upside down are here also, they said, when they see him coming. <laughs> he was a man that was shaking towns and cities and doing a work so effectively. When they threw him in prison, a governor was trying to approach him and talking to him when he was alone. Why? Hoping that he'll give him some money. The governor was not looking for some 20, 30 rupees, you know. He's looking for some big money because he heard that Paul was from a rich family. His parents got their Roman citizenship by money, by, by being a nobility, by being rich. You see, he came from an aristocratic family. And he knew that he had money. You see, they made Paul poor. They made Peter poor. They made, you know, like one preacher the other day, you know, said, Jesus borrowed a boat. He didn't even have a boat. <laughs> and when he had to pay taxes, he had to go tell, told, him, told the man, go catch a fish. And on the fish, fish's mouth, there is coin. <laughs> what do you think Jesus is? He didn't even have a coin. <laughs> They just want to say that Jesus was poor. So he borrowed a boat. He went to catch a fish and there was coin in it. How many poor people go catch a fish and find coin in it? <laughs> Boy, they'll become rich by catching fish. <laughs> Jesus was not poor. They make Jesus a poorless, penniless, poor, penniless person, you know. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. But you read in the Bible one time they came and asked him, where do you stay? He said, come and see. And when they came and saw, he said, stay and go. Now, if they, somebody came to our house, some of our houses are so small, we can't tell people to stay and go because we only got so many square feet. You know. But Jesus had enough place for a couple of people extra to come and stay. He was not living on this platform. 
on the sidewalks of the streets. Uh, you see. When he said he didn't have any place to lay his head, he was trying to find a room. As he was traveling one day through that place, through Samaria, and because he was a Jew, they said, keep walking. Don't come into our town. So he said, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head tonight. But they made it a life's philosophy, these fellows, you know. They took it and said, you are a preacher, you must not have a place to lay your head. My God, he just didn't have a place to stay that night. I've been in that condition where I just kept going. I, I remember I went into the forest area one time to see one of the Christian workers, and there was no hotel there. We just climbed up. You know, this thing and in the middle of the night and we just didn't know where we were going and we just went up there and they said, why are you coming here this night? This is Virapan's forest there, as they said. My God, I said. Then we stopped there. I said, is there any hotel? They said, no. So I just looked up. There was a bench outside the house, uh, somebody's house. I pulled up the bench and brought it near the car. I laid in the back seat and put my leg out <laughs> and slept on the street. That doesn't mean I'm poor and I can't find a place to sleep and, you know, this is the way to live, you know. Oh my God, I was sleeping in a car with my legs stretched out in somebody else's bench. <laughs> Their whole intention seems to be to somehow make everybody poor, and make everybody, but the Bible says exactly opposite. It says in verse 11 of Job 36, if they obey and serve him, this is the truth, my friend. Believe the truth. If they obey and say, if you obey and serve him. You see, Paul suffered for the gospel's sake. He was persecuted. He suffered because of the gospel's sake. Because he was going town to town preaching the gospel. There was a lot of trouble. And he suffered, yes. Suffered in so many ways. But he was not a poor man. He was not suffering with the curse of the law. He was not a cursed person. He was a blessed person. Because he himself said, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. After having said that, you think he was poor? Chica 